Welcome to Eurodollar University. My name is Emil Kalinowski, and I'm joined by, with Jeff Snyder, the head of global research for Alhambra Investments. Jeff, we're going to be talking about an emotional issue, and it's about inflation. It's about inflation and price increases, and the two are not the same. And people may say, well, that's a distinction without a difference, but you wrote an article just the other day where you make the, the impassioned point that there is a big difference. We're going to go over it. We're going to go over, yes, there are price increases, but there is an inflation. It's important. I know people may be thinking, how can that be? It's important that we identify the nuance in this. And the article I want everyone to go to will be found at the Alhambra Investments blog post, blog site, October 13th, 2021 is when it was posted. And the title is, A Perfect Time to Review What Is and What Is Not inflation and why it matters so much. Jeff, I've highlighted the first two paragraphs here that I want to read out. So basically, it's very important what you say in the beginning. Tell us what, what's, what's happening. You know, I think you hit the nail right on the head, Emil, when you said that, you know, people get the idea that if prices go up, how is that not inflation? What is the difference? And why, if there is a difference, is it just a technical thing? There's one of those technicalities that we you know, maybe economists throw out there every once in a while to throw everybody off the scent. I mean, it kind of sounds fishy when you say prices are going up, but it's not inflation. Well, wait a minute, prices go up, that is inflation. But as it turns out, in fact, uh, there's a massive, tremendous difference, not in just what it is, but what it means. And that's really the two parts we want to go over today is that what is inflation and what is not inflation, even in an environment where consumer prices are going up, and what does it mean that if consumer prices are going up and it's not inflation? What are the two differences here? And they're actually very, very, very uh, crucial distinctions. Let me quote you. By clarifying the situation, demonstrating over and over how there is no money printing, therefore there can't be inflation. We aren't saying that prices aren't rising. They obviously are. But by dispassionately analyzing the situation, given its clear lack of any monetary basis, what we are doing is pointing out what instead must be responsible for driving costs of living higher. Regular viewers know what we mean by there is no money printing. New viewers may be saying, well, the central banks are printing and the federal government is kind of printing, maybe, sort of. But as this whole show is all about, it's the commercial private banking system that far outweighs that printing, that money creation over there. And that's the system that's not really contributing. We're going to go over some data first in your article and then give examples of what happened in the 1970s, the great inflation, and show some graphs. Yeah, and then we're going to, then we're going to talk about later in the show about why that isn't money printing and what is money printing and what should be money printing. So we're going to cover all our bases here, or at least try to cover all our bases here to make sure that we say, okay, there's a distinction here. When we say the word inflation, we mean something specific, and that's money, overflowing money, too, too much money chasing too few goods. You probably heard that before. And if there isn't the money, the overflowing monetary condition, it can't really be inflation. I know, Emil, you like the term monetary inflation. I think it's redundant. But I mean, maybe that helps the audience uh, understand what we're trying to say. We don't see the money printing. Therefore, we don't see monetary inflation. But yet we're not saying consumer prices aren't going up because obviously they are. They have gone up and they've gone up a lot, the most in more than a decade. So something is happening to consumer prices. We're telling you it's not the money part. We'll get into that later. So what is going on and why does it matter? September CPI in the United States released on the 13th of October, 5.4% year over year increase. That's very, very high. That's the headline everything included, food, energy costs. What about just core inflation, right? If we remove the food and energy, maybe that shows us the underlying less volatile day-to-day -day stuff that's not food or energy. That's also up very high, 4% year over year. That's in line with what we've seen between May and August for both of those measures. What about the month over month figures? And that's where we're starting to see that the inflation acceleration is now deceleration. On the monthly changes, uh, especially in the core rate and especially in services prices, 
they've they've come right back down and their their inflation or at least the the rate of consumer price increases are about the same as what they were before we ever started all this mess. So in other words, as you said last time, I think it was Emil or a couple of episodes ago, you called them the camel humps, which I thought was a pretty elegant term for consumer prices. And we saw it again, we saw this last year and then we saw it earlier this year. Last year it was in the June and July of 2020. We saw the rapid but very short-lived increase in consumer prices. Then it went away. It proved to be transitory. And then it started all over again earlier this year in March and April. And ever since April, May, June, July, now August and September, we've seen the rate of change slow and slow and slow and slow. So that the last couple of months, it's really back to where we were before. So Month over month change, I mean, year over year changes are still pretty large because we're comparing to low price, low price indices last year. But month over month, we're seeing that the other side of the second camel hump from 20, uh, the 2021 camel hump, because inflation pressures are receding, not accelerating. That's right. And I'm showing the graph right now from your article. This one is seasonally adjusted, less food and energy. So core, we see the two camel humps. And a little bit lower is rent minus services or services minus rent. Help me, Jeff. What yeah, is it? Service sector minus rent. So it's not the goods economy that's been propped up by all the frenzy and durable goods spending and things like that. And you take out the rent component because that tends to be non-economic at times as well. So you're looking at the underlying cost of pretty much everything else in the consumer price bucket, which is, again, that's one of people's most common complaints. Well, yeah, if you take away food and gasoline, so what? I mean, we have to live and we have to you know, put gasoline in our cars. But that's really, it speaks to the definition of inflation, what inflation really is, which is that the prices of not just one or two things go up, it's the price of everything that goes up. So yes, we see the we see gasoline prices go up because of oil prices. We see food prices go up at, at times, especially nowadays. Food prices have accelerated over the over this year in particular. But what we don't see is the rest of everything going up too. And that's really where you get into the distinction between inflation versus what other things might be going on in the consumer price bucket. Inflation is everything. And it's not just that everything goes up. So yes, the core rate goes up and energy prices go up. But then they keep going up. They go up and up and up and won't ever let up. That's what really inflation looks like. We're going to talk about energy because we're going to compare energy prices today and how they're accelerating compared to how energy prices were accelerating during the great inflation. But before we go there, just a quick diversion. That last graph we were looking at was all about services. And you make the point in your article, you want to look at services because we had a goods boom and you see in the data that that good, goods boom is fading and what is coming back is the services portion of the economy, which was always lousy. Do I have that correct? Yeah, it was. I think that's really probably the best way to put it. It was, it would never, it was always lousy. So again, we're, you know, inflation is where everything goes, everything works. And what we're seeing or what we've already seen of or this year of consumer prices is that it was very narrowly construed. It was not broad based. And it doesn't look like it will be sustained because, there, again, there is still money printing behind it. Okay, now I'm going to pull up another chart that shows energy prices as per the CPI measurement. And what are these energy prices? Energy motor fuel seasonally motor fuel. adjusted. And we're going to go back yeah. 13 and a half years. And we're going to see prices are up recently. Yeah, so let's compare and contrast what in an actual monetary inflationary period looks like with what we have today. And let's start with gasoline. I mean, motor fuel prices are one of the few things that people really notice and pay attention to because you're kind of forced to. Every time you go to the gasoline pump and you stick the, the, the nozzle in, you look at the rate that you're paying and, and you, uh, you look away in disgust because it's, you know, what is it? It's over $3 a, a gallon in most places around the country, if not more expensive in, in other places. So you realize that hey, gasoline prices have come up from where they used to be. But what you don't, what you don't probably uh, appreciate is that yes, gasoline prices are much higher compared to last year, but compared to the last decade or so, they're they're pretty much in line. In fact, the last time the Federal Reserve got to tapering their QE back in 2013, from then to now, gasoline prices are actually lower than they were, you know, what was it, eight years ago, and they're lower than they were 12 years ago. So yeah, gasoline prices are up year over year, and that's a painful 
cost increase that consumers have to absorb, but it's not inflation. It's just the vagaries of how consumer prices behave volatilely in this uh, overall disinflationary environment. So it's disinflationary because overall consumer prices and just motor fuel here, and we'll see again that it's not just motor fuel prices, but gasoline prices over the long run haven't really done all that much. They've been, they've been up and they've been down, but really they haven't gone anywhere. And that's, you know, that's a sign that something else other than inflation is going on and setting the consumer price agenda. Now, this is episode 129, Eurodollar University. But in episode 126, Macro Peace Theater, where I play the role of Alistair Cook and I introduce a story and read around macroeconomics, I read one of your pieces, a very important one, from last week where you explained to the audience how there's been this divergence in each of the four euro dollar shortages that we've had between metal prices and energy prices and oil. And what we've seen is that metal prices turn down first and then energy seems to be a lagging indicator. And in this, in this article, we're going to be comparing present day to the 1970s, but there's a quick sidebar I want to make is you bring to our attention, hey, you know, energy prices, if you look at where the dollar is going and recent data, energy prices may be turning down lower soon enough. So for the audience that want to learn more about that, that's in episode 126. I'm going to show the 1970s, Jeff. Is there anything you wanted to add to my last point? Yeah, that, that you know, even though we're saying that maybe global growth is slowing, we've already seen commodity prices turn lower, that sort of the metals and industrial commodities turn lower, yet oil prices continue to go up. And what, we've, what we said in that article is that that's not abnormal. In fact, that happens time and time again. Oil is usually one of the last commodities to turn lower. So, you know, oil prices can go up even if... Uh, the quote unquote inflationary environment has already changed to something else. So we were looking at the last 13 and a half years, a contemporary picture, our era. A lot of people are comparing it to the 1970s. Now this graph that we're showing is the 1970s, whereas that graph was clearly bounded. This is a trend. And Jeff, you make a key point here. We see two huge spikes. But the part in between was, was a lot too, right? The huge spikes kind of ameliorate and kind of hide the fact that prices were rising very high, very quickly, year after year, for a long period in between there. Yeah, the great inflation was relentless, right? And that's really, that's what inflation is. It doesn't stop. It doesn't take a break. It doesn't pause. It, it continues to go on and on. And even in oil prices, which you can see those two big spikes that didn't have to do with monetary inflation, those were supply shocks, you know, even outside of those two huge spikes, in between them was a period of, again, unrelenting rapid inflation in, in motor, motor fuel prices as well as all other prices. And that's really the difference. And you can, I think, I hope you, in the, the chart you're showing, Emil, kind of hides the, uh, the uh, you know, understates the impression too, because you don't realize how big of a difference it is when you start the 70s from when you end the 70s. Motor fuel prices were up you know, an enormous amount over that time. And again, in between, because of those supply shocks that made it seem you know, like the, the, the uh, inflation was condensed until those two episodes. No, it was, it was constant. Even when there wasn't supply shocks, gasoline and oil prices continued to rise throughout the period. And they never took a month off. They never took a day off. They continued to go up and up and up so that and by the time you got to the end of the decade, oil prices and gasoline prices were nothing like what you had started the decade with. And that's one of the reasons, one of the key reasons why people don't really have fond memories of the 1970s. What the bell bottoms, the lava lamps, the music, the pharmaceuticals, Jeff, I don't know why people don't have a fond memory of it. All right. Well, yeah. Why were people paying attention to everything else except oh, yeah. the, uh, the economics of the age, yeah, right? Yeah, the war. Dreadful. All right. Let me quote you. Everything goes up, core included, and it goes up year after year. No breaks, no pauses, no reversals, nowhere to hide. That's like a movie poster, Jeff. Great. It's awesome. It's very exciting. A horror movie. That's really what, and you know, that's, again, I think you're, that's exactly it, Emil. We're, what we're doing here is make, by making the distinction of monetary inflation, the inflation monster is monetary. And so if we don't have the monetary component, which again, we'll get to later, then we're not talking about the same monster. It may be a different monster, but it's not as monstrous. 
if there's not the monetary component behind it. Yes, the great inflation was a horrible period, which uh, you know not didn't just affect the American consumer. It was it was a, a global problem, but it was it was it was in many ways a disaster. Not quite on the level of the Great Depression, but not really that far from it either. And understanding why and what happened in the 1970s is important because we're trying to figure out whether or not we're repeating that, or if we're not repeating that, what exactly is it that's going on right now? And you can see the huge difference between, again, unrelenting uh, uh, consumer price pressure that was everywhere. It wasn't just gasoline. It wasn't just food. It was everything. So even the core rate, this is why we scrutinize the core rate so much, because it's not that we're ignoring food or energy prices. What we're trying to see is if these consumer price trends are getting into everything. And so if it affects the core rate in the same way as it does gasoline or fuel, whatever's going on, then we're starting to think, OK, there's something unifying. There's something, something really inflationary here, because even the core rate is going up relentlessly month after month, year after year, year at a quick heavy, painful, uh, disastrous pace. So for the audio audience that are listening to the podcast, we just showed a chart from comparing the core rate from 1970, as well as the core rate from 2009. And the 1971 below, well, it's just not even on the same planet, right? But you say, all right, well, maybe the post-2009 era was different. Maybe central bankers didn't know what they were doing, but now they do. Jeff Snyder, and they've got the government that's helping them, the federal government, the central government. And so let's zoom in on the 2020 period and compare the 2020 period to the early 1970s. And Jeff, tell us how the early, this is the best possible comparison because we're looking at the greatest reopening economic acceleration possibly in human history and about face compared to the 1970s early which were actually in recession. So a very ugly economic period versus full on face forward, no helmet, no net, no pants. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to start. Um, you're exactly, look, yeah, 2008, 2009, a lot of people said money printing, government spending was going to lead to the 1970s. Fast forward to, you know, 12 years, didn't happen. Now everybody said, okay, we got that wrong. But but this time, 2020, 2021, this time will be the great inflation because epic amounts of QE, you know, helicopters that are, you know, into the trillions. How could this not lead to something like the great inflation? And again, I don't think people really realize what the great inflation actually looked like because, I mean, it's 50 years ago. So how would we, many people probably weren't born? And even those of us who are old enough to maybe slightly remember don't remember all that much of it anyway. But if you put it on a chart and say, okay, Great inflation 2.0 began in May of 2020 when the economy was reopened the first time and the first government helicopters were dropped in the United States. If we mark that point and compare it to, you know, 1970, what you'll see is uh, no, not really. In 19, and as you said, Emil, 1970, from December 1969 until November 1970, the economy was in, the U.S. economy was in pretty sharp recession during that year. So in 1970s, I'm, we're showing you on the chart here. That was an economy in recession, and yet consumer prices, core consumer prices, which meant the prices of everything, were going up at a rapid pace even during that recession. Now, compare that to the last 17 months or so, and what you see is that outside of that couple months in earlier this year, when Uncle Sam's double helicopters were combining and the supply shocks were at their most, it still didn't even come up to the same level as, not even close to the same level as a deep recession during an actual inflationary period. So even with the, the most, you know, the biggest, hugest, gigantic government stimulus possible, the most severe supply bottleneck since the 1970s, and yet consumer prices outside of a couple months, they never even got close to something like the great inflation, the, the early part of the great inflation, we're still not there. And then we're seeing what, what we shouldn't see in an inflationary period, which are pauses and breaks and brends, because the great inflation, as I said before, was relentless month after month after month after month at you know, almost a straight 45 degree angle in core consumer prices, which again, inflation, it's everything that goes up and it goes up and never stops going up. So what we see over the last 17 months in consumer prices, yes, it got very sharp. Consumer prices did rise. Core consumer prices did rise relatively rapidly. 
but in a very short-term condensed narrow burst. That's not the same thing as inflation. And yes, so if we look at that graph, we see a surge, and I guess some people might extrapolate that that surge is going to continue. But let us go back to the beginning of the show where we were saying... Yeah, maybe so, but we've already seen that it started to decline. Bingo. That's what we talked about before, yes. that the month over month changes that... You know, the camel humps, the second part of the camel hump is already pretty well defined. And you can already see the bend in the core consumer prices and services prices, which suggests, no, that they're already we, we've already seen the break. It's it, we're, we're in fact, by looking at it this way, we're actually isolating the cause here. You can actually see what the cause must have been. And it wasn't money printing. And it's not, you know, something incredible or some some uh, awesome mystery. It was you know, the government dropped a bunch of money on the economy and it responded for a short period of time. But that's not inflation. Yes, consumer prices went up. But for that reason, which means, you know, if it's not or if it's not money behind it, if not money printing and it's not really inflation, then we wouldn't expect that it would continue. It's not going to be like the great inflation. It's going to have its short run impacts, which are there. You can see them. Prices went up, but then they don't go up at the same rate after it's all over and set or all over and done with which is where we are now. Any final thoughts, Jeff? In the, in the article, you say the Federal Reserve is right, but we shouldn't blame them for this. We should blame them for any other things. Do you want to touch on that? Yeah, we're not, you know, some people say we're Fed shields here. They've accused me of they being be. a shield for the Federal Reserve because just... it sounds like I'm letting them off the hook when it's far from, you know, it's exactly the opposite. What, I, what we're trying to do here by saying this is not inflation, this is not money printing, we're trying to get people say you're trying to direct people's attention to what must be going on. You know, if it's not money printing, if it's not really inflation, then there are other things that we need to focus on. One of those that what the cause of the consumer price rise was the government and supply bottlenecks and those things, those, those temporary things that already faded. The other part of that is the money printing. Since there is no money printing, that has serious ramifications. Those ramifications aren't inflationary, though, they're deflationary. So we're not letting the Fed off the hook. We're putting the Fed on the right hook. We're not saying the Fed should be blamed for money printing because there wasn't money printing. Instead, we're saying the Fed should be blamed because they won't admit to the world they don't print money and that we've been, we've been living with a monetary shortage for a very long time. And that has created the lack of inflation, the lack of economic growth, and left the, not just the United States, but the, ent the entire global economy in a horrible position where we haven't had legitimate economic growth for more than a decade, which has caused enormous consequences. Just none of those consequences are inflationary. And so nothing has changed in that regard. So we don't see the money printing. We don't see the consumer price increases as inflation. We see them as something else. Yes, they did go up earlier this year, but we're already seeing the other side of that, which is consistent with the idea that there was no money printing. It's something else. And therefore, we have other problems to worry about. In part two of this episode, we're going to look at what commercial banks are doing in the United States, private banks, not public central banks, because they are the ones that create the vast amount of money that makes the global economy run. And we're going to review the Z1 financial accounts, and we're going to see where they're putting their money. And that's going to show and re what what's the word reconfirm re underline the point we've made in this video right now is that inflation is going to be very unlikely because of what banks are doing.